General Assembly meeting up for Monday, this is Monday at 15, 7, Don't study at Acts, Thursday at 6, hay ride and wiener roast, Friday the 26th. Um, remember, if you're making a donation to, the, to our vision of faith, envelopes are on the back. Uh, you can use that to put your, your uh, donation in. Don't steal the envelope for uh, recycling them, so just keep that in mind. Uh, choir adventure for Christmas program today at five o'clock, and also uh, I'd say that we'll have announcements. Let me praise him this morning. Is praise the Lord, and let's stand as we sing. Please get your blood flowing and stay warm. Thank you. 
appreciate your prayers and uh, thank you. And again, we have anonymous requests, several. We just ask you to keep all those in your prayers as uh, the days go on. Our prayer again begin this sweet hour of prayer. And uh, following that, Brother Dean will be uh, leading us in prayer this morning. Sweet hour of prayer.
that's improved at the top dollars in the end. Um, so now we just kind of went over something. So, um, yes. I'd like to put um, Craig on the drone on the on our therapist. She has to be back to you tomorrow. Carly Armstrong. Okay. And Carly Armstrong. Okay. Um, again, as we proceed with our. Richard, one more. Okay. Uh, I have appraised my uh, friend Jennifer Meeker, that was just a very young woman has had her double mastectomy and reconstructive surgery and has gone done all of her chemo. And as of Friday, when she was released from the hospital, they say she is cancer free at this moment. As we say, let's proceed and to the Lord Press Motion Service. Uh, we're on the roll off our room, sorry. Brother Randy has our communion meditation this morning. So, uh, Brother Randy, this time. <clears throat> Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Good morning. I thought about what to do with the communion meditation and uh, being called to remind me, I'm really thankful for a pastor that calls and reminds people of certain commitments that they make. And because right now we're coming to a point of service, really in my heart, this is this 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 is the crux of the service thing. The point where we come to communion with Christ Himself. If you go in your Bibles to First Corinthians eleven twenty six, actually is the crux of what from 1123 to 34, it explains all about communion and how it was put in place by Christ for us to be able to break bread with Him. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about before and after. Before you were a Christian, before you were regenerated, your spirit and your soul would be regenerated before Christ when you believed in Him. You Baptized in him. You are different than you are now. There are things you want now. There should be things you want now much different than what you wanted before and your goals and your goals towards. I want you to think about something. Large churches in this country, what's going on with big churches across this country. You look at a big church and you see how some churches have changed. The music, all the instruments that come on. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not judging. I'm not asking you to go. I'm just asking you to open your mind up and think about the changes that take place within our own churches, particularly the large ones, and how communion becomes, in a lot of places, secondary. My church back east serves communion once every five weeks. That's it. If I um, happen to be back east on one of them Sunday, I get communion. If not, I, I get I make communion myself. We serve communion every Sunday. Is a reason why. If you look, okay, if you ask, in those big churches, where to find communion, like we do, they tell you you gotta go to your grandfather's church. Praise God, we're a grandfather. <laughs> Hopefully, and I pray to God that we never change our behavior here because this is the most important aspect of our worship. The reason why is when we come before the table, when we 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 should be looking in a clean and open spirit to commune with God. First and foremost, we should confess our sins. All sins. I'm very bad. Well, I, I, I don't want to approach this table with that. If I have a problem with a brother or a sister, or if a brother and sister has a problem with me, we are commanded by God to take care of that before we approach this table. That's how clean He wants us. Because He wants us to start again fresh at the 
talked to Bogey about this. I said, Randy said, that, you know, it's something, communion is something we do every week. And as long as me and Bogey have breath, you know, the rest of the leadership, this church never has to worry about this being on a back table or in a back corner or anywhere else. We come to celebrate you. You are God. You are our Savior. You are our Messiah. You have given us grace. And we do appreciate that so very much. Thank you, dear Lord, for thinking about us. Now, let us get our slate clean. Let us start anew and have you foremost on our thoughts. As we grab around the table and we take the cup, let us realize that it was that blood that you sacrificed. You didn't have to do that. I realize that. You could have called down the angels and administered you, but he said that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was for you to die, and you died. 
for sinners like us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this time we can meet around your table. This time, Lord, we ask your blessing upon this gift that's given to you to further your work here and, and maybe we can reach on beyond. We thank you for each and every blessing you give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
verse number 16. The book of Psalm chapter 139. Psalm 139, verse 16. Okay. This is a psalm written by David, and in this particular reference, he refers to a time before he was born when the Lord saw his unformed substance. And I want you to know something that God has given to you. I want you to take this personally this morning and appreciate where God has placed you. And quit wishing that you were born in a different time and a different place. The Bible says, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was none of them. And when I took a look at this passage a while back, on October 6th of 2018, I had at that point lived 21,962 days. Uh, what's the date today? 14. 14, so we're at eight that I have now been on the planet for 21,970 days. I look pretty good. I'm just <laughs> A few pages back in the book of Esther, chapter 4, and verse 14, there was a woman. There was a woman to whom Mordecai was making an appeal for help. She was a queen in a pagan land. <coughs> the Israelites needed help. And Mordecai had come and begged her to help. She wasn't sure whether to step forth or not, but the last part of Ezra 4, verse 14, the very final line of it says, Who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this? And so I want you to understand that. There's a reason you are where you are, why you were born when you were, and why you are here in America at this time. Quit wishing that you were in some foreign mission field, thinking, boy, if I was just on a foreign mission field, I could win people to Jesus Christ. Be content with where God has placed you, right here, right now. Romans chapter 5, I'd like to give you at least three passages of scripture. As a trilogy, if you please, in four to three stands. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. Someone else came and did something for us at just the right time. That was Jesus Christ. Let's just go to the big one, shall we? Came in better than that. When the time was right. God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law. And in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, the apostle Paul said, While we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Say that at the right time. For such a time as this. Such a time as this. In all the days that were ordained for me. I'm not going to tell you my whole story over again, but I've lived long enough to live in a land that America has changed over the years, hasn't it? And it's not been for the better, unfortunately. Bruce Drab, minister of the West Alabama Church, uh, sometime during this past week, he handed me out. He said, Take a look at this, would you? And he read the definition out of Webster Dictionary of the word humility. This is a modern definition of the word humility. Here it is. Listen carefully. Modest or low view of one's own importance. Humbleness. Some synonyms modesty, meekness, unassertive, lack of pride. Lack of vanity. That's present day definition. Here's a definition from 1828. 1828. In ethics, freedom from pride and arrogance, humbleness of mind, modest estimate of one's own worth. In theology, humility consists of lowliness of mind, a deep sense of one's own unworthiness in the sight of God, self abasement, penitence for sin, and submission to the divine will. Things have changed, haven't they? No mention of God in the present day definition. But from 1828, God is still front and center. Things have changed. Times have changed. I shared not too long ago a story known as the Bulletproof George Washington. Some of you have heard the account. Maybe most of you have not. None of us, likely, unless you were... Was anyone still in school in 1934? 
Margaret's shaking her head yes. <coughs> so there's a chance you may have heard the account that George Washington's part during the French and Indian War, in which his life literally hung in the balance over a two hour period of time. Of the 83 commanders who were on the field that day, 63 were casualties. And the only one that had not been shot down was George Washington. All the other leaders had taken a bullet one way or another. 63 died. George Washington wrote to his brother after that battle, By the all-powerful dispensation of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability for expectation. I had four bullets through my coat and two horses shot under me, yet I escaped unhurt, although death was left me my companions on every side of me. Fifteen years later, an old respective Indian chief sought out Washington, and the Indian chief explained that he is the one, he was the one that had led the Indians in battle against George Washington and the other troops on that day during that conflict. He said to George Washington that day of what had happened, he said, I called to my young men and said, Mark, yon tall and daring warrior, referring to Washington, himself is alone exposed. Quick, let your aim be certain, and he dies. He said, our rifles were leveling you, rifles which but for you do not how to miss. Was all in vain. A power mightier far than me shielded you, seeing you were under the special guardianship of the great spirit. We immediately ceased fire at you. I am come to pay homage to the man who is the particular favorite of heaven and who can never die in battle. This account of God's miraculous care of Washington and Washington's open gratitude for God's divine intervention. <laughs> Could be found in literally all student test books until 1934. Today, if you have ever heard of it, through the bulletproof George Washington, some of our history is lost. And folks, stories like that need to be returned to the forefront of our education in our homes, in our schools, and in our government. By the way, it is available online, David Barton, wallbuilders.com, and you can. Uh, you can go to that. I don't get any proceeds from that. Okay? <laughs> Put a plug in for getting God back into the center of our hearts. To let the mind of the master be the master of our mind. Well, my story is an amazing story. I'm not here to rehearse it before you. I've told it to most of you, so I'm not going to go through all that stuff, how my lineage goes. But I think I've got a pretty amazing story of how I ended up in a Christian church. And it is by the grace of God that I'm here today. And had it not been for the prayer of my earthly mother, I'd not be standing before you. I don't believe you today. I still may, but to think that a woman who gave up her child for adoption would make a prayer that I'd be placed in a Christian church home. And then for me to be in a Christian church home unbeknownst by the courts, and then to be raised in a Christian church home by a mother who knew my blood and and then to be able to trace my lineage back and back and back and to realize that had it not been for Betty Albert's prayer, I would not be here for such a time as this to speak to some of the most amazing people on the planet. But you, you have an amazing story as well. And when you and I realize that our story, that we are strategically placed right where we are by God's providence. I think it's then and only then we begin to realize that our story is really his story. And when our story becomes his story, then it becomes our story, his story for his glory. Are you following? Yeah. I'm not here by accident. I'm not here by chance. I believe that I'm here by God's providential design. Someone cared enough to open their mouth and speak to me the word of truth. That would be my mom and dad. And he spoke to me. I can go down through scripture of individuals and like Joseph in the Old Testament. One of my favorite Bible heroes from the book of chapter Genesis chapter 20, 37 all the way to Genesis chapter 50, a period of some 22 years. Joseph would be sent to check upon his brothers, and as he went to check on them, they were filled with hatred for him over the years because he had related to them dreams of how one day he said, You will bow down to me. They weren't real happy to hear about that. They hated him because his father had made a special coat of many colors for him. And so when he came on that day, uh, they, they bought it and they said, let's do this. And he threw him in a pit. And while they were sitting down eating lunch, while Joseph was in the pit, the Midianites came by. And they sold him to the Midianites and went home and told their dad that Joseph had died. And years and years later, while Joseph was sitting in prison, Pharaoh has a dream and he's troubled by it. And then, oh, that's right, now there's a fellow in prison that interpreted my dream for me and called Joseph out. Joseph, Joseph says you're going to have seven years of 
the seven years of good crops, and then you're going to have seven years of famine, and Joseph goes to the pit to be second in command. Only the Pharaoh, and then his brothers show up looking for food some 22 years later. And in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, one of the greatest stories of the providential strategic planning of God with a long game purpose. Joseph standing before his brothers after his father had died. His brothers are now saying, Now that dad's gone, Joseph's going to kill us. And Joseph says this in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Don't be afraid. You meant evil. You meant to harm me. But God meant it for good to bring about the saving of many lives. Is it possible that God could have arranged all that? <laughs> Are you kidding? Do we need to go back to Genesis 1 1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The God that we can create out of nothing, all this universe that we can see, can direct our footsteps in such a way that He'll put us in a perfectly timed place, in a perfectly positioned to give the first perfect message. Not by chance, folks. That's your spiritual heritage. I think about individuals like Nehemiah, chapter 1. Who asked one of his brothers, how, how Israel, how, how, how are our, our brethren doing? And there's a bad report, they're not doing well, the city is in disrepair, it's destroyed, things are bad, it's not good, it's never been so bad as it is now. And Nehemiah wept and mourned. And then he says, And I was cupbearer to the king. If you know the rest of the story, Nehemiah goes into the kingdom and says, Nehemiah wasn't going to happen this particular day. What's wrong? And Nehemiah begins to unfold. He prays to the God of heaven and he unfolds the story of his, of his kinsmen. And the king says, Well, what can I do for you? So I'd like to rebuild the wall. What can I do for you? And if you read the account, the, the pagan king financed the whole project of the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. As the people had a mind to work, they came together. Nehemiah strategically, purposely placed in the right place for such a time as this. And Esther, ladies, you've been studying that, right? What a great session that was. And how Esther is placed in the perfect position to deliver Israel. And even as you read Esther, one of my favorite accounts is where the king couldn't sleep. And so he decided to get up at night just at random, pulled out a history scroll. And as he was reading, he read of a man, some man by the name of Warren Mordecai, who had saved his life. And he got to thinking, I wonder if we ever honored this man. And so the next morning, when Haman, the one who wanted to destroy all the Jews, when Haman comes in, the king says, Hey, uh, what would you do for a fellow that, that needs to be honored? There's some fellow that I would like to honor. And Haman thinks it's him, thinking it's him. So uh, I would put your best clothes on him and I'd let him ride on your horse and I would parade him throughout all the city and show him to be such an honorable man. And the king says to Haman, who wants Mordecai dead, says, Go do this for Mordecai and you leave him to the city. <laughs> and at the end of the at the end of the book, the very gallows that Haman had built to have Mordecai killed ends up being for him and his, and his boys. You talk about the providence of God. You can't escape it. You can't, don't get too worried about the way things are in our world affairs today. Did you be grateful for where you were placed by God's strategic plan with a long term aim and purpose to make a difference in this world? That ripple effect that you create, believe me, you create one. You take a look at that picture there on the side there. It's on the bulletin there. It's on the screen now. Which means we're about 15 minutes into the message, by the way, is the timing for that. That we would embrace the calling with which we have given, been given by God and be satisfied that we've been placed in here for such a time as this. And these individuals here, they were placed right where there. That's 1949, by the way. And Ron was reminding me this morning that on the far right of the picture, you see a picture of his dad holding Shirley as a little baby. And if I'm not mistaken, to the far left here, this might be right there, Tony Wallace and Tom Green. You think it is? There she is. I didn't bring my pointy with me. Huh? Tyree? Okay. But there's about 120 of them all together. You see that big bat up there on the split, uh, left in the back? Up there? Yeah, that's my mother and I'm ready to I was wondering. I was looking at that last night. Uh, when I drew that, when I put that up there a couple years ago, I said, like, man, that's a big hat. That was your mother. <laughs> Each one of them, and they're located right, they took the picture over there on that side of the building. Okay? 
The tree is no longer there. In the background, the house is directly across there where James and his wife Marlene live. We don't find how long used to live. We never done it before that. Wow. Spiritual heritage. And then on the, over there, right there, I put the picture we took back in October. What was that? Maybe October 7th, 1st or something, 2017. Spiritual heritage. Yeah, October 1st, 17. We've all been strategically placed. When we say strategically placed, we're talking about being placed in a particular position with long term aim. The Bible says, in the moments of time, when the time was right, God sent forth Jesus. God strategically placed Jesus into this world where it becomes flesh, born of a virgin, that he might redeem those who are under the law. God strategically placed Jesus, born in Bethlehem, fulfilled all the prophecies. And he said, I simply come to do your will, O God, O Hebrews. That's Jesus. That's Jesus' summation of his life for being placed where he is placed. And that's not as a kid. I'll tell you a little story from when I was a kid. All the way up to a teenager. The preachers didn't mean to pray the cross this way, but whenever they would talk about foreign missions, we need to pray for our mission things. We get, somehow I misunderstood what they were trying to say. I kind of got the idea that I needed to go to a foreign mission field so I could win people for Jesus. So I said, boy, if I could just go to win, if I could just go to be a missionary to Germany, I can win people for Jesus. If I could just smuggle Bibles and go to communist Russia, I could win people for Jesus. And the older I got when I was in, the, in the, my 20s, I still kind of had that mentality. If I could just go to some foreign land, then I could win people for Jesus. And I heard this booming voice from heaven. It's not really. But I heard this booming voice in my conscience from God saying, Shut up, Dean. If you won't try to win them here, you're all fooling yourself if you think you're going to win them when you go over there. And I had to shut up and realize I have to take the in place right where I am. Win people for Jesus. And if I won't win them here, I'm only fooling myself if I think by going to some foreign land I would win them over there. Now, every one of you have a spiritual heritage, a spiritual timeline that goes back in time. And I'm going to allow to my left and your right to be the back in time. Or we can go there. I'm going to stick with those that I was born on August 20th. 1958. On December 20th, 1960, I was placed in the home of Paul the Moon of Life from the Christian Church because my blood mother prayed that I be placed in the Christian Church home. And the courts did not even know that my parents were from the Christian Church until we adopted them from the fleet. So I believe God strategically placed me by His providence. And then, but before that, the reason my blood mother asked me to pray that prayer was because her brother, Uncle Frank, my Uncle Frank, had won her to Jesus Christ. And she was a, a member of the First Christian Church. But before Uncle Frank came to Christ, he was a member of the Syrian Orthodox Church years before that. And when he was in high school, his school teacher, after school, would have Bible studies with him. His school teacher was Mildred Welshman. That name Welshman might, might bring the bell for some of you. you. Remember that little yellow tract that it turned to a brown tract? Facts concerning the New Testament church written by P.H. Welshman. Does that ring a bell? Mildred Welshman was P.H. Welshman's daughter. And so all the way on the line talking about Christ, and I was baptized on December 7, 1969. Because on the 20th of December 1960, I became a part of their family. Because Betty Albert had prayed that I be placed in a Christian church home. Because her brother Frank, who had been Syrian Orthodox in high school, had been taught by his high school teacher, that and that happening today, his high school teacher teaching him after class the Bible. And he came out of that and became a Christian only. And the reason Mildred Welshman taught him that was because her daddy, P.H. Welshman, who my aunt hated, by the way, the aunt of my adopted family. Oh, she said, if P.H. Welsh were in heaven, I'd rather be in hell. Well, that's not the spiritual timeline I choose for me. And you've got to decide. But P.H. Welsh were in heaven. And somewhere, and that's about as far back as I can go, but somewhere along the line, someone had taught P.H. Welsh were right about the Lord. And we keep going back and back and back and back to the base, and we get the cross of Jesus Christ. 
where Jesus dies on the cross, did before that, at the right time, he's born of a woman, born of the lawn, the little baby comes to the world, and go back 4,000 4, 4, more years to Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created. That's where my spiritual timeline goes. How about you? Yeah. More important for past. And where's it going to go from here? Where's it going to go from here? Will there be people after me? My children, my grandchildren, friends, neighbors, acquaintances, aunts, uncles, enemies, whoever, you name it. Even Saul, later Paul, would say, but God, who separated me from my mother's womb, was pleased to reveal Christ to me. It took him a while to get them out. <laughs> I don't even think he was on the prospect list of the early church. We, let's try to read Saul. I, I don't even know what they were thinking about. But what's more important is who's going to come to Christ because of us, right? And then someone else receives Christ, and now by the if you're doing the, the math here, folks, by the time I'm over here, I'm I'm dead long gone ago, right? In the church, I pray continues. That picture taken in 1949, that's almost 70 years ago. All right. Until the final trump. The final trump. Spiritual timeline, 1949, 2018. To the final throne. Go out and declare it, folks. You've got good news this year. Amen. 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 I don't know that now they wouldn't have sung this song. They probably sang songs like Jesus is all the world to me. Right? I don't know if they sang the song we're going to sing right now. Jesus name above all names. I think it's one of Joe. Let's find that Joe. For such a time as this. A spiritual time. We sing today. We have yet to be in it. I guess call upon the name of the Lord. Turn from your sins. Be buried with him in baptism. Rise and walk into his life. Something like this. I'm probably coming right now. Great enthusiasm. Say, I'm going to serve you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that generation of faithful there. Thank you for the generation here and for the generation to come. Let's stand and sing. Let's be thankful for what we are. Jesus,
Who'll be up there on the stage, Lord? Will they be speaking the truth? Who'll be sitting in the chairs that we just occupied? Will they love you as we love you? Is our love what they ought to have? May our love be pure and sincere, Lord, so we'll be a credible message to the world whose only message they might ever hear will be us. So that the Son can see Jesus Christ and become the salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. 